Very special to share with Rabbi Yossi Ben Shushan. I think we're here to I want to thank um, our org, Dave Latiro, for experiencing tonight's event. And there's a round of applause for all of us for this event. We have this very special topic tonight, anxiety free L. That um, usually there's a tremendous fear. People, when they want to get through L, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, how many seconds they are left. But we're going to, Rabbi Yossi is going to share his. Um, his knowledge on tonight's very special topic. And hopefully, we shouldn't have we should have an anxiety-free L. But uh, maybe one thing that we should maybe not have anxiety about, but something maybe we should think about is that is that um, Baruch Hashem, we're here, we're all a Shia, we're trying to grow and learn Torah. But but unfortunately, maybe some of our friends and family members could be not have the, the the great honor to learn Torah. We have a Jewish education, as we know, there's thousands of Jewish public school students, and Chazak is on the forefront of organizing. Um, public school programming in 15 different locations, Sunday, Sunday school and after school programs. In the last five years long, has helped transfer over 1,200 children from public school to yeshiva. So talking about anxiety free, that we should, we should all take um, a, minute, uh, a second, take a, take a moment, reach out to a friend, family member, co workers, and <laughs> reach out to Kazakh. That will um, be a tremendous honor, and it's a great, great honor to call upon David Batiro to introduce our guest here. Okay. Um, I'm, I don't want to do a mic. I, I think everyone can hear me, right? And beautiful. I'm not a speaker, but I do want to take the privilege of introducing one of my Rebbeim, who we, a lot of us on, the, on this side of the aisle have spent with uh, in, in Or Sameach. Uh, what was it four years ago? <laughs> it was sure, four, sure, it was four years ago. <laughs> so. Everyone's very young. Um, anyway, so about six years ago, I dealt with a, um, a tragedy in the family where my grandparents passed away, like one by one, over the course of five years. And uh, it really like motivated me, uh, dealing with the tragedies, uh, to do more events like these. And uh, Baruch Hashem, we've done dozens, and we've partnered up with Chazak, which really makes it all happen. And I'm proud to be a partner with them. And um, if anyone has ideas to partner up and make events like these either here or in a community or a location near you, obviously you can hit up uh, Chazak or myself and we can make it happen. And events like these are relatively cheap to, to do. Bar Hashem, Rabbi is still care enough to come out and speak and, and uh, encourage Klal Yisrael for minimal to no money. And, uh, and we're here to really give inspiration. <laughs> Keep going, keep going. I'm enjoying this. Position, right? <laughs> but he's here. And now that he's here, Baruch Hashem, he's willing to, uh, to speak to us. And it's a rare occasion. I don't think there is any other lectures scheduled in New York City for the rest of the year, so, or at least the rest of the summer. Um, so this year. Well, it's Rosh Hashanah. The rest of the year, right. Yeah, it's the last event of the year in, in Brooklyn. So we're very Woo! happy to hear from him. Without further ado, I've got to see you There's a very, um, none of you stand up, right? No, it's, a, it's uh, I'll never get used to that in girls' crowd. It's, um, I always forget how tall Robbie is. He looks shorter on his WhatsApp profile. It's only his face. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> It's always, it's always uh, humbling to have one of your Talmidim introduce you. Humbling and, a, and scary, because you don't know what he's going to say. That man has been to my house. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> he's seen things. <laughs> he's been on trips with me. I'm just saying, like, you know, he has information. All right. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, David Baturo, Chazak. Um, these are people, uh, David uh, very kindly you know, spoke very nicely about what it takes for me to, to come out here, but this is what I do, and you know, it's, uh, it's what I do. Um, the unsung heroes behind the scenes, those are the people I have no idea how they, like, uh, how they go about it, how they do these things and do it all the time and get zero credit, zero acknowledgement, zero... Much like our sponsor, Chazak. No, much like really, much like Chazak, because it, there's no way I've seen the numbers. And well, first of all, either someone's lying in that office or these people are single handedly going to bring Mashiach. It's one of the two. I have no idea which one it is. I kind of am hoping for the bring Mashiach one. But when you see an organization like Chazak, and this is really going to segue, segue us in for tonight, I've got to bring up a Tehillim. 
Believe me, we're going to need it. Um, um, it is really going to segue us in for tonight when an organization like Hazak goes out there and they're not, they're not saying in this very vague term, oh, we're going to try to, we're going to, but they have all of these kids coming, coming from all sorts of, is that also, sorry, yeah, perfect. coming from all sorts of backgrounds and really, it's amazing where we came to. I remember back in the day, um, someone's very familiar with Chazak, Rabbi Eli Freilach, who uh, was very, very close to my family. Rabbi Freilach, uh, back in the day, used to stand, before he had Ezra Academy, he used to stand outside of public schools. I mean, you would never get away with doing this nowadays. <laughs> it would, would never work, but he used to stand outside of public schools, and any white kid, basically, that walked out, he would ask him, are you Jewish? Um, all the white kids said no, so he got a bunch of hirings. All right, all right, come on, all right, all right, come on. Um, not my joke. Officially. <laughs> um, every time of mine knows I just lied. <laughs> um, and he ended up getting a, uh, a whole school, a whole school going, but that, that's what it took back in the day to get a kid from point A to point B. No one, let, no one wanted to let you through a front door. No one cared. What's an organization like Chazak asking, really, what is their, their input? Yes, every now and then they have a fundraiser. Aside from that, what's their real request? If you know a kid, this is like the easiest thing we could ever do. If you know a kid, all we want you to do, that, that's in public school, that's a Jewish kid, all we want you to do is let us know who they are. All right, it's a little bit like the KGB, but on the, going the other way. It's like, let us know who they are. We'll take care of the rest. That's beautiful. There's no string attached over there. There is no extra ask. That is the level of real chesed. The level over there is, all I'm asking you to do is be involved in a way that's actually impactful. I can't know about every kid that's out there, so just help me out in that way of knowing who's out there. When you get to the level, when you're that good at what you do, when you're that successful, that all you need is the name and you'll take care of the rest, you know that organization not only knows what they're doing, but that organization has been clearly, clearly blessed by the Rabbi Shalom to create a tremendous effect in Kali Yisrael. So a big, big thank you to Chazak. It's, it's always an honor, uh, really. It's always such a big honor to, uh, to be with them, especially since I'm pretty sure this is a fact. Definitely the first, um, definitely the first speech I think I ever gave that was ever recorded on, on Torah anytime. I'm pretty sure this is a fact. I think I'm about to offend somebody because if it's not true, but I'm pretty sure it's a fact. The first speech I ever gave that was recorded was, was through Chazak. So very, very big Chazak uh, Baruch to, uh, to them. Okay. Oh, broke my finger, sorry. Uh, going, <clears throat> going into tonight, an anxiety-free Elul. So first, like most things that we need to do, we need to debunk everything that we know about something in order to know something new. What that means is, <clears throat> with everything in life, we abandon the old and go with the new. And this isn't a bad thing. We tend to believe it to be a bad thing. But with everything in life, if I'm a, if I'm a child, if I'm a little child, and I grow up, and I don't fit into my shirt anymore. I get rid of that old shirt, and I go with the new. Apparently, I just found out that if you get a new kidney, you still keep your old one. I don't know why. I, I, that, I just found, not gonna say from who, he knows who he is, I just found that out like 20 minutes ago. But aside from that, when I grow out of a shirt, when I grow out of a coat as a child, I get rid of that old one, unless you're a Ben Shushan, then you give it to the kid under you. <laughs> I don't know if that's just my family, but <clears throat> being the fifth one in the family, I wore many girl coats. The point is, no, I, yeah. Uh, the point is that that <coughs> that when you when you grow out of something, you get rid of that thing and you go on with the new one. As a matter of fact, if you were to hold on to every article of clothing you've ever owned from the time you were born 
all the way through, you would be called a hoarder. You'd be a weirdo. You're holding on to things that you have no business holding on to. They're not yours anymore. We understand this with so many things, but we totally abandon this idea when it comes to anything that matters. Holding on to all the clothing you've ever had since you were a child would take up a lot of room in your house. And that is, and, and would be annoying. And the odds are, whoever you're either married to or living with will be very annoyed at you. But aside from that, aside from maybe ending up on some TV show about people who keep too much stuff, your, your fear of life doesn't have to be that high. But to hold on to ideas, to concepts, to things that we were told when we were young, and fiercely hold on to them, and never evolve, change, or grow from that, that's a lot worse. Our capacity to be able to hold a truth in our mind is very limited. And the more conflicting ideas we hold, the more conflicted of a person we are. So when we're growing up with this idea that the word Elul, people would be a lot more okay with the summer ending, I know, I know that's like an illegal thing to say uh, uh, around, but people would be a lot more comfortable with the idea of the summer ending if, during, uh, if Elul was Adar. If we had Purim in another three weeks from now, if we had Hanukkah in another three weeks from now, people would have a lot easier of a time. The summer ending by us doesn't just mean camps ending, it also means that we're getting thrust into this completely contrasting polar opposite existence than we just experienced over the summer. Not only that, a lot of us take it with us into uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, into Yom Kippur. In the school systems, there, there's a line where we say, at the end of the year, we say, I think this kid is, is gonna do great. You know, he's going from ninth grade to 10th grade. I think he's gonna do great in 10th grade, depending on how his summer goes. Everyone knows that line, depending on how his summer goes. When we used to accept for Israel, all the time, we would have, and this would happen very often, every school in Israel has this. You, you have a kid come in, Elul, you have a kid come in in September, you sit down, you meet the kid, you start learning with him, they, uh, I, I used to do some of the recruiting, so it would be me at the uh, receiving end of this. A lot of times they'd come up to me and be like, what in the world uh, happened over here? What's with this kid? Well, what's with this kid? No, what's, with, what's, with, uh, what's with this guy? Why in the world did you accept this kid? He completely doesn't fit, he's not ready, he doesn't do this, doesn't do that. And the answer was always the same, whether it was true or not, I don't know, but the answer was always the same. To get yourself out of trouble, you'd be like, I met the kid in November of last year. Over the summer, and over that time, he ended up doing this and then getting involved in this and getting involved, and I was a completely different kid. The summer's known to be this time where once we relax ourselves, it's, it's interesting. We say, I need a vacation, I need a break. <coughs> I need a break, I've, I've been working really hard, I need a break, so I take a summer and I take a break. The odds are that I hold on to so many more, I hold on so much easier to so many of the negative habits that I developed over that break than over the break holding on to the positive habits I had when I was really working hard. It's like I accidentally, a couple of times a week, wake up at 6.30 in the morning. And I'm like, well, I'm up anyway, and this is what time I normally get up, so I'll just keep going like this over vacation. It never happens. The odds on that happening on a day I'm supposed to be at work is a lot higher. However, we go from this very uh, relaxed moment into this very hard, and it's scary. And, 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 and the connotation that so many people have from when we're children of being raised that this is judgment, that this is, this is something I've said in a, few, in a few of the classes that we've been giving lately, is that we really have to start differentiating on what we think things are from what they really are. The Rambam says that the reason why we say Hashem's hand, Hashem's eyes, Hashem's anger, Hashem's uh, uh, hatred, is not because Hashem has eyes, ears, anger, or hatred. It's, it's ways for us to understand. And the Rambam gives a very clear warning. He said, don't get caught up in this. Don't get caught up in these examples. Because you're gonna start thinking of him as a person, as a vindictive person. 
we're going to get to that re really a little bit later, but you're going to start thinking to him as someone that you can relate to. It's the same thing with our language. When we say something like Elul and judgment, din, and, and uh, a punishment, and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and all these ideas, tshuva, we tend to translate these things for ourselves to understand, but we need to remember we're not doing a very good job of that translation. No one could do a good job of that. Our school did a fantastic job of an impossible job, but it's still not, and they'll say it themselves, it's still not good enough. That's good to get you somewhere. <clears throat> but the ultimate goal is to be able to understand what it says to you. If you think that you've read through, learnt, really learnt Derech Hashem off of reading the English translation, the English translation of it is fantastic. But if you think that you've, you, you, off of Feldheim's translation, you're crazy. There's no way that you understood the, the poetic beauty to how he speaks. There's no way. The Ramchal, it, it's beautiful. Now, this isn't to say that everybody needs to uh, understand. My point is, is don't get caught up in our translations. When we say things like, uh, um, when we say things like uh, a tshuva being repentance, chet being our averot, <laughs> okay, that would, be, <laughs> that would be a translation into Hebrew also, but chet uh, being a sin. These ideas, these, these don't accurately depict what this really is. But it is why we're so built into us with this fear. If you don't do Rosh Hashanah properly, if you don't do Rosh Hashanah properly, everyone you know is going to die. Because that's, that's, who, uh, that's who Hashem is. That's what He does. He just goes around like a four-year-old with a gun. You're just, that's, that's some of our views of Hashem, is that he's a four-year-old with a sniper rifle on top of a building, just, and we're like, as long as you don't get seen, you'll be fine. Just hopefully he doesn't notice you. That's the best you can hope for. Because usually the people who taught us these ideas, in their classroom, the best we were able to hope for is not to be noticed. If I could just fly under the radar in here, I won't get punished, I will do well, everything will be fine. I don't need, how many parents have told me this, they're like, I don't want him to like score so I just don't want him to get killed in that class. I don't want him to get in trouble. That's our hopes for ourselves in a, a lot of times. We just want to try to avoid the bad. And that becomes the definition of our relationship with Hashem. When we go into, when we go into Rosh Hashanah, there are so many people, if you were to tell them, you know, this is the time that you can ask for Osher, you can ask for wealth, you can ask for so many amazing things. They're like, who am I, you joke? I'm just asking not to get killed this year. That's all I want. Mi Yechiel, mi Yamos. That's everybody's uh, uh, remembering of Rosh Hashanah is, those, is one Nisana Taikov. Who will live and who will die? And we know that's not even what it means. We know it's not even what it means. Because if it is, this whole thing, by the way, we can all leave now. <laughs> the whole thing's not true, right? Because Hitler lived for many years, right? He was alive for a while. He went through a couple of Rosh Hashanahs unscathed. And I don't think there was a question in Shemayim. They're like, you know what? He might turn it around this year. 44 is his year. No, no. No one thought that in Shemayim. And they were like, he's pretty much sealed. <laughs> he's going for it. No one thought of Bill or Russia. No one was like, listen, this guy, he's got something good inside of his neshama. Like, no, no one was saying that. They all knew what he was. So it's not me, Yechiel, me, Yamas. If somebody is a Russia, they're going to die. If it's me, Yechiel. Who's going to live? Who's going to actually realize that, they, that life is meant to live? We have a... a <clears throat> We have a, and I'm sorry, and to get to this place of understanding what we're doing going in, the, the, the halakha always is that 30 days before, we know this from Moshe Rabbeinu, 30 days before any chag, any anything, we prep. But we don't do any of those the way we do, uh, except for in Israel. Uh, 30 days before Hanukkah, they're serving donuts. Aside from them, right there, aside from that, I think some Americans took on the minhag. Aside from them, <clears throat> no other chag do we really like sit down and, 
and, and, and everybody like sits down and really, some Kolelim will start, you know, third is for Pesach, will start reviewing Pesach, third is for Purim even, Megillah. But no one really takes this as like a, a, an across the board, but Elul, Elul, everybody's involved. Especially if you're Sfari, it's a party. You've never eaten that much at 5 a.m. It's unbelievable. The, so no one gets that involved as we get during Elul. <clears throat> but during Elul, we're very, very involved. Why? Because to get to this place, it's not just the halachot involved. It's not just learning halachot shofar again. That's not what it is. That's not what it is. There aren't many halachot involved in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Definitely not many that you can't sort of gather on your own. It's a fast day. What the parameters of that fast is, <clears throat> we could do that in 20 minutes. This 30 days, this 30 days is about prep. It's about a mental and emotional prep. Why? To get rid of years and years and years of clothing that we do not need anymore. We're all afraid. We all have like built-in Jew anxiety at this point. You get a very different reaction from a crowd when you say something like Jewish anxiety to saying Jew anxiety. <laughs> if you say Jewish anxiety, you're like, I know you. Say Jew anxiety, it's like, does this guy not like Jews? <laughs> it's very different. You get a very different reaction. But you get, we, we have a, <clears throat> we have to get rid, uh, we have already built into us this tremendous amount of anxiety that Hashem's trying to get us that if I don't do that right thing at the right time and the right, if I don't have that exact kezayis, then, then this is when he's going to, and that's in, that's in general. That's, that's all year long. Then you take the time where he says he's going to be judging and I, I'm just fainting all over the place. I'm walking around with panic. And we have to shed these layers, and I want to be very clear why we have to shed these layers. Not because this is a new age idea, that this new uh, a rabbi is coming and saying that it doesn't apply. That's not what I'm saying. It's because it's a game of the Yetzirah, it's a game of the Satan, it's actually bad. He wants you to have Yish. He wants you to give up. He wants you to feel anxiety because a person stuck in that place will not do anything. They're, it's called frozen in fear. It's called frozen in fear. Frozen in fear is not madly in love. A madly in love person can't sit. Someone who's frozen in fear is literally frozen in fear. He wants to freeze you with fear. He wants to make you think that the best you could possibly do is not get noticed. And when, <clears throat> like the Ramchal says at the end of the second paragraph, when we are bodek into what the, what the Satan, what the Yitzhara is telling us, at any mo moment, if we're bodek into it, if we uh, uh, search into it, if we, if we go over it at all, just look into it, the sheker of it is so clear and it all falls apart. For example, for example, on Yom Kippur, how many people had this experience? Maybe it's just me. But how many people have had this experience on Yom Kippur that, Baruch Hashem, not in recent years, but definitely when I was younger. Um, you're sitting there, you're diving on Yom Kippur, and you, you're thinking about a, like a pizza or a brisket sandwich, or you're thinking about something, and you're hungry. And you push it out of your head and you keep on davening, and you stop yourself and you're like, what am I doing? Hashem doesn't know that I'm thinking about a brisket sandwich. You think, he, you think I'm fooling him? He knows. So really what I'm doing right now is lying to his face, and he knows. It's so much worse than regular lying. It's lying right to his face, and he knows. Who am I trying to fool? I know what I was doing yesterday. I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I know I'm not even really that sorry about any of that. So who am I? I'm lying right to God's face. Now, now let's be bold. Now, this is the Yitzhara. This is the Satan coming to try, to try to throw us off our game. And he's so good at it. My brother Ari always loves to say he's so good at it. Because I'll tell us that he's not even allowed to touch us. He's not allowed to come near us on Yom Kippur. 
And the answer is, so how do we have a Yetzar on Yom Kippur? It's very simple. He doesn't, he doesn't show up. He did such a great job during the year, he has us on autopilot. These are just our ha- habitual thinking, that there's no way I really feel bad about any of this. There's no way I'm really doing tshuva. There's no way I'm actually accomplishing this. There's no way this is happening. So I have to think of the first negative thing I can about myself to make sure I'm still, I'm still grounded. He has me on autopilot. He has me so well worked that I'm his puppet at this point. I'm, a, I'm doing his job for him. Now let's look into this just for one second. Hashem made a day a year for Averot, for you to come home and discuss the Averot that you did. Discuss the distance, what it did, how bad it was. Not only that, the really, really religious guy or girl, the really, really religious one, they don't use the, the achet that it says in the, in the Mahzor. They use that one. Then they also have like another one they bring with them. The chida one. They have another like three booklets that has a bunch of added sins in it that you know you've never done. But you're going to say you did them then just to, just to be from about the sin. That's the frumkite. That's, that's the, the chumrah involved. On a day like Yom Kippur. Is the more sins you do, the better. Because this is when you show up and you really speak about it. And the more you have to talk about, the closer you're going to get to Hashem. So say everything you possibly can. And you show up and you do all that. And his argument is, you're too much of a sinner. You're too much of a sinner for the day for sinners. Like that doesn't even, I don't know why my rabbi's here. I don't know why my Rosh Hashiva showed up. That I don't understand. But me, I should, we should switch spots today. <laughs> I should be sitting in the front. I'm the foremost guy in this room. I was Yotze every single one of those Hafei wrote Bechol Adeot. I enjoyed them thoroughly. Every one of them. I did them more than once just to make sure I was the answer to them. Sometimes I stayed up all night doing them. It wasn't, it wasn't, it, sometimes I didn't feel I did one right and mom just kept me up. I researched this stuff. I researched it. That guy, he belongs there, Yom Kippur, more than anyone else, but the, 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 the Satan's going to come and be like, no, 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 this isn't for you. And when we look into it, we're like, wait a second, that doesn't even make sense. By your logic, this is more for me than for anyone else. The Yitzhara does not like this when we do that. He does not like when we show up like that. Definitely not when we defend ourselves like that. Let's go into another lie. Another lie that, 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 that we can poke holes into all day long. And when we, when we prep properly, and we realize these things, and we're going to go into what the preparation is in a minute, or, or part of the preparation. Everyone has their own preparation. But <clears throat> another one of the lies so that we know what we're getting towards. The, um, <coughs> someone said to me, I was speaking to a crowd, and I was saying how um, there was one time I, I was speaking to Rabbi Berkowitz, my Rebbe. I think, I think we just sort of broke some kind of a record. I think I was speaking for a half hour, and I didn't mention Rabbi Berkowitz once. It was like the first time. It's, it's pretty impressive. I think I'm starting to have my own ideas. <laughs> this is dangerous. Um, so <clears throat> I'm joking. All of that was his. I just didn't say it in his name. Um, I was talking to my, my Rebbe, Rabbi Berkowitz, one time. We were in the middle of doing Hilcha Shabbat. And he, uh, and we were all the way in the beginning, and it was, oh yeah, yeah, it was all the way in the beginning. It was, uh, it was about buying food for Shabbat and how Hashem's going to always reimburse, how Hashem's going to always. So I said, I, I was having a private meeting with him, and I didn't have, it was all the way in the beginning when I first got to the call, and I didn't have anything to really bring up, or I didn't feel comfortable bringing up anything right away. So... I said to him, I was like, how do I know? Like, Lamai, I, I love Shabbat. It's my Shoshan and Shama. I love buying things for Shabbat. But how do I know I'm really doing this for Shabbat? You know, I, it might be just, you know, I, I'm just a fat guy that likes food. I, you know, at the end of the day, I just, I, I like to eat. So I, uh, I buy extra food for Shabbat, and that's it. So I work with a smile, and he, obviously, and <laughs> not because of the joke, by the way. <laughs> but just, um, he smiled, and he goes, uh, 
he goes, across the whole Tyra, and your mom has changed my life with this, he goes, across the whole Tyra, no matter where you look, no matter what you see, no matter what you do, you will not find anywhere. And that's authority, by the way. That's real authority. Like, to say you can, anything that you ask me, I can find it in the Torah, that's impressive. That's fine. That's impressive. But to say it doesn't say it anywhere, that you have to really know what you're talking about. Because you've seen everything. He said, no matter where in the Torah, no matter what you see, no matter what you look at, nowhere in the Torah are you going to find a mitzvah to be hard on yourself. Nowhere. Not only that, not only that, not only won't you find it as a mitzvah to be hard on yourself, you might even be able to find it that it's not a very to be hard on yourself like that. He said, so what are you doing? You're buying food for Shabbat, you enjoy it, that's what you think the Avera is. Because you're not allowed to enjoy something. No, when it says Tanug and you're supposed to enjoy it, they're, they're talking about the, 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 the Tanayim. Well, they used to enjoy things differently. It's not a fat guy eating. And say, no, who, said, who told you this? Why, 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 why not? Why is it not just a regular person eating and enjoying their food? Why is that not? Who told you that? And the answer is, is that these are small clothing that we've just kept with us all these years. That the, that, that the closer I am to Hashem, the more depressed I am. I'm supposed to be more depressed. I'm supposed to be walking around all sad and all. That, that, that's what we think. And we're so wrong. These, these, these things that have come out of nowhere. We're so wrong. One of the things that I, 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 was, uh, I was speaking to, uh, to someone and I was saying this idea and I was saying that when we're hard on ourselves, we actually tend to stay small. When we're hard on ourselves and we feel bad about ourselves and we shame ourselves and belittle ourselves, our response to that as human beings is to escape. We want to run away from that feeling so we, we distract ourselves and we escape from it. It never inspires us to do better. We always look at ourselves and like, I'm so disgraceful, I'm so shameful, I'm going to go take a nap. That's, how, that's the response. It's never, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better tomorrow after I take the nap. When I wake up, no, 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 what really happens is I take the nap, I forget how shameful I felt, and I move on with my life. I don't have to now feel that again, or I, I will eventually. I said, however, when you have a person who feels amazing about themselves, who realizes how great they are, realizes their potential, realizes that they can't fail at anything they actually try to do. They will never stop trying to do things. They will never stop growing. They view failures as finite. They view failures as a, as a certain amount of, of stairs, of steps that they need to get through in order to get to success. Because success is infinite. No one can ever take that success for you once you get it. The failure is finite. The failure won't always be there. As I was saying this to a crowd, and every time I do, someone always says, but then how are you ever going to change if you don't feel bad about yourself? I'm like, you weren't listening to a word I just said. You're not going to change like that. That's not how change happens. In reality, that's not how change happens. They say, but, but, but Hashem's still going to judge me, and He's still going to... And this is where this idea is a cancer among us is that it makes us believe Hashem to be this petty, small person. A human is the worst part of it, but still, just petty and small. I said to him, if someone came up to me, right, I, I, uh, I have to change around the story. Last time I said this, I wasn't being recorded, but I'll change around the story just a little bit. I... Oh, good. That's not so much of a lie, and it changes the story just fine, just enough. Um, I was, uh, I got a phone call. Um, really, the guy came to my house. Now you know this true story. No, I got a phone call, and uh, a guy, a guy says to me, he's like, uh, I need some advice. Um, my uh, my son got into a fight uh, in school, um, and uh, he he gave another kid like a bloody nose or whatever. <clears throat> So I said, uh, I said, okay, uh, how old's your son? So I actually didn't say that right away, by the way, but I found out later, and like a little into the conversation, that his son's like six. <laughs> I thought we were talking about like two 18-year-olds, but fine, like his, kid, his kid's six. Even if it was 18-year-old, I still don't really fully understand the story myself, but son's six. Got into a fight, the other kid, uh, what do you call it? He said, my son comes home, and he tells me right away, tells me what happened. 
So they got into a fight today and this and that. And he said, the other boy was bleeding. He's like, I saw the kid felt really horrible about it. And he explained to me how the fight happened. And it was like two boys horsing around. And he's like, and his elbow clipped this other kid by accident. And it wasn't by accident, but it was kind of bad. He didn't know he was going to bleed. Da, 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 da. He doesn't know his own strength. OK. So I said, OK, so what's the problem? He said, the issue is this other kid's father is like subpoenaing video cameras <laughs> from the school. And he wants to know exactly how it went down, what the arc of the elbow was. He wants the whole. And I was like, no one's taking it seriously. He's like, the school's very scared. And I'm, I just took a step back to think to myself, like the, the, the phone call before this was, you know, a suicide call. Like, I mean, it was this. I, I was like, I don't understand. <laughs> I'm like, and this is really where I asked, I was like, how badly broken was this kid's nose? And he's like, it wasn't broken. He's like, it was just bleeding. I'm like, how old are these kids? And he's like, six. I'm like, teen? Hopefully. It's still, eh, I still wouldn't have, uh, but I was like, teen, right? He's like, no, just six. I'm like, what's happening? I'm like, why is he taking it so seriously? So he's like, I, he wants this and that, and he wants, uh, he wants my son to be suspended. I'm like, I don't even know if you're legally allowed to suspend a six-year-old. I have no idea how that works. Unless he came to school with a gun, and even then, suspend his parents. I don't know. Suspend someone else. I don't know. But I don't know how you... Well, I told him, I was like, you know, make a get well card and whatever and go to the house. He went, uh, it, went it, it, it went fine. But I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, wait a second. Why was I so, you know, why? Because of the way this guy presented the story. Maybe if the other guy called me, and I, I like to try to think like this, maybe if the other guy called me, I would have been like, wow, that is really scary. You know, that is, I don't see myself ever having really went for the other guy's side, but maybe. My point is, this guy, who's telling me the story about his son. He was like, I know the kid. He's not violent, he's not what he called, he's, he's, he's rowdy. And he'll get into a fight every now and then. And I even heard from what he said, like this isn't the first fight this kid got into, and he probably got into a few other fights, and that's why this other father was making a big deal. But he was still too much of a big deal, the kid's still six, and so on and so forth. But when you hear a father talk about his son, he's always like, hey, listen, I know the kid. I've seen him sleep. He's an angel. <laughs> it, 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 there's nothing to, he, he, didn't, he would never intentionally hurt this other kid. Something took him over, something this, something that. How many parents I've heard say, my son, I promise you, he's a really good kid. It's just sometimes his anger just takes him over and his anger becomes a separate to these parents. It becomes a separate part of this kid. And, and they might be right, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. But it's like a separate part, and there's, there's dealing with the kid and then dealing with his anger. And this might be a real mahalach to use. I'm not, I'm not taking that away. M my point is, is that it's very compassionate. And we are not, by any stretch of the imagination, more compassionate than the Rabbi Nishlael. Not by any furthest, farthest, there is not a human being alive that is more compassionate than Hashem. When he sees us on a judgment day, he's re-seeing us, and you can ask any parent. Every time their child gets in trouble, you have two options. You can either get closer to the kid or further away. Those are your two options when your child gets in trouble. You can either get closer to them. My mom and I have a very deep bond only because of the amount of trouble I made as a kid. We built a relation. I'm telling you, my mother is forever like the, the person I will run to. If I'm running from the cops and I know I'm going to get into a shootout, I'm going to choose my 78-year-old mom to back me up in that shootout. Because I, I, I know she's going to have it. At no point is she going to change her mind during that shootout. You have two options when someone's in trouble, when your kid's in trouble. You can either show compassion, which is our first and initial, and not only that, especially back in the day, it used to be, I don't know any parents like this anymore, but I remember used to hearing about this, that they're like, yeah, they think their son could do no wrong. I don't know that that exists anymore. I don't know any parents like, my child could do no wrong. It's like, they all go the other way. They're like, he could do everything. <laughs> like, I don't know anything that's off this kid's radar. It's, it's amazing. There are 40-year-olds that are jealous of the party life this kid has. Like, so, I don't know, 40-year-old party? I don't know, okay. Bad example, but point is, it used to be that parents used to have to fight to, to not see their child as an angel. Because that's our natural reaction, is to see our kid and be like, you have to understand, I've known this kid since he was born. 
I've seen him in Pampers. I've seen him without Pampers. I know this kid. Believe me. He's really, really a sweet kid. And I'm telling you, 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 your head would spin if you would get some of these phone calls. Parents like, he just, he just rammed his car into the building, came out with an AK-47 and said, I'm gonna kill all of you, but you have to understand something. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> he's really a good kid. That's why he didn't really end up killing anyone. I'm like, that and the cops were right there. It was a police station, so. <laughs> They converged in time. They're like, but why would he do it in a police station? <laughs> Unless he wanted to be caught, it was a cry for help. And I'm not saying they're wrong. But, but we're not more compassionate than them. When Hashem sees us and sees what we did wrong, we're like, I'm the worst thing in the world. And I'm telling you right now, if you want to see a parent break down, have their kid run, in, run into them and be like, I just accidentally hit this other kid and he's bleeding. I'm the worst person in the world. This parent will crumble into a billion pieces. They'll grab the kid, they'll hug him, they'll kiss him and be like, you are the greatest thing since the creation of Earth. You did it by accident, everything's gonna be fine. I'm gonna hide you in the basement, we're gonna be fine. We're gonna move to Argentina, we'll change our names, we'll get new passwords, everything's gonna be okay, I promise. They'll lose their minds trying to protect this kid. You're not bad, I promise you're not bad. You're a tzaddik, you're amazing, you're not bad. Hashem is doing the same exact thing. And where's the shaking, quaking kid who's saying, no, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Why are you so bad? And this is why we have an insight now into what's gonna happen after Mashiach. Why, why are you so bad? Who convinced you of that? We know the real answer is, right, when this kid is saying that kid's father, I'm like, excuse me, I have to have a conversation about it with somebody. And you're gonna go have a conversation with the kid's father about how he's gonna talk to your kid from now on. You can be the shyest person in the world. You're about to have some conversations. There's going to be furniture moving in that room. A lot's about to happen. Hashem says, the Yetzirah is the one who's convincing you of this. I am going to shechted him the first chance I get. The minute I don't need him anymore, he's getting shechted. The famous question is, well, why? I mean, he's just doing his job. He didn't have to do it that well. He caught my kid and he tripped him up. That's fine. He didn't have to do it that well. He didn't have to make him feel that way. So first second I got, I'm gonna shock them. But we opt into believing the eight Sahara. One last point, and then we're gonna go into Tehillim. Tehillim Chav Zion, it's one of the Tehillims that we, that we say every day over the course of, uh, of Elul. It's brought down in, uh, in the Gemara, it's brought down in Sfarim. We, we say it over the course of, of Elul, and if you're, if you're gonna do it, I'm not, I'm not a promote opponent over here telling everyone they should. I mean, if, if you go to Dominic, we do it every day, but whether you do it or not, at least read it. Read it in English if you have to. We know that Elul is uh, alluded to all over this uh, parakeet Um And yeah, Elul is alluded to over the course, we'll do that point, uh, last point. But Elul is alluded, alluded to all over this parakatelum. One of the final psukim is Lule. Lule hamanti lirois betuv Hashem be'eretz chaim kaveil Hashem chazak ve'amets lebecha ve'kaveil Hashem. And this is really over the course of the whole parak. We go into all these ideas of what happens to a person when he rises above. If you ever wonder, if you ever wonder, um, uh, and you, you can read through it, you can find it for yourself. Really, this, is a, this part's a share for Rosh Hashanah mainly. But during the Simanim on Rosh Hashanah, you ever wonder that there's, a, there's an obsession over the Simanim about our, our Oivav, about all the people who are trying to hurt us? Let all my adversaries, let all of them, sound very egotistical, like everyone's out to get us, like I'm the guy to get. If, if all of these nations could try to get me down, I'll. Right, I exire, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rise above all those that are trying to get me here at Son. That all the people who are trying, all my enemies, all my adversaries shouldn't shouldn't be successful in getting me. Like, who are all these people chasing you? Like, either you're very popular, or or you might be a crazy person. I'm saying you might want to get all those voices checked. And then, but the Pirish over there says a beautiful, beautiful idea that these oivav are the voices, they're, they're in our head. They're all the parts of us that are keeping us down. They're all the parts of us that are keeping us small. Over the course of this, this entire parakeet 
we keep uh, uh, referring to all the people that are pakshupana, that, that are, that are, uh, that are avakes from me, that are trying to, 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 to hold me down. And we say to Hashem, uh, uh, don't let them get me, don't. And we finally end by saying, Lule Manti Lirot Betuv Hashem. Lule is backwards. Lule is Elul. Lule. Lule Manti. In Elul, what do we do? Manti Lirot Betuv Hashem. We remember one very important key. Lule Manti Lirot Betuv Hashem Be'eretz Chaim. If I didn't know, says David HaMelech, and this is one of the most important things we need to remind ourselves, not only during El, but every single day. If I didn't know the good Hashem wanted to give me, here, not there. We're not talking about Olam Haba over here. That's not what David Melch was referring to. The Eretz Chaim, he was talking about over here. My Rebbe, Rav Asher Rubinstein, <laughs> always used to tell us, I am an Olam Hazanik. He always used to say it. I am an Olam Hazanik. I love this world. I've never been to Olam Haba, and I don't know what it's like, but I am an Olam Hazanik. I love this world. I love the pleasures of this world. I love the enjoyment of this world. And that's why I'm a from Jew. Because it is the greatest way to live here. It is the greatest way to live right now here. Says David HaMelech, Lulei Amanti, what's El supposed to bring us back to? Lulei HaAmanti, Leros Betov Hashem, is to remind us, what does Hashem tell me to do? And this is why we just lost the Beit HaMikdash. What did a sinner, what did somebody who did something wrong against Hashem? And when they used to sin back in the day, it was like when they used to do an Avera. It was done with a beautiful amount of Kavana. It, it, it wasn't this just Stam, a guy uh, uh, wanting to, to uh, uh, fulfill a pleasure. Right? It was done with meaning. It was done with real meaning when they did a sin. And even with them, when they did a sin, what, was, what happened? What was Hashem's response when we had the Beit HaMikdash? Karban Chatat. You have to bring a Karban Chatat to me. Why? Shouldn't they have Chayrim? Chuck him. He wants to rebel. Get him, get rid of him. Hashem says, no, 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 no. There's only one reason why somebody does a sin. There might be a million other uh, 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 parts to it. But the reason is always the same. He is far from me, says Hashem. He is distant from me. So what do I have him do? Karban chatat. Get over here. I don't send you away. I bring you closer. When you rebel against me, I bring you closer. Because that's the reason you're rebelling. That's solving the problem immediately. Come into my house. I want to see you. I want to talk to you. We need to reconnect. Because when we reconnect, you're going to realize you don't want this. I don't want this. We want to just... I come on Rosh Hashanah, I come during the whole Elul to remember one idea, one major idea. Hashem wants to be close to me and He wants to give me good. All I need to do is show up. It's not about sin. It's about bridging the gap that sin might have caused. It's about bridging that gap. But all he wants to do is give good to me right now, right here. This isn't an anxiety-ridden time. This is one of the most beautiful moments we should possibly have because it exists in a moment. In that moment, we realize Hashem is the most compassionate. There is nothing more compassionate than Him. Even His din is with Rachamim. It is the most compassionate. When I show up to Hashem on a day of judgment, it is a day that I finally get understood. It's like showing back up to my father or mother when I did something wrong. They're the only ones who have seen me since day one. The only difference is Hashem is the one who has seen me since day one, a bunch of different gugulim worth. He knows things about me. He knows reasons why I do wrong more than even I know. More than I can possibly know. More than my parents could possibly know. And I'm his son. I'm his neshama. I'm a part of him. He, he, he is the most compassionate towards me. Not only is there nothing to have anxiety over, 
this should be the cure to all of our anxiety, is that this is the one place, this is the one time that we get really seen for who and what we are. We get seen and understood. Why show up then if he's like that normally? Because if I didn't, I would forget that that's what I am. I would forget that he still loves me. I would forget how important my connection to him is. And if I forget that, there's no point to any of this. The anxiety is all a game of the Yitzhara, trying to convince us, trying to trick us. It's not to say that we don't take Elul seriously. But seriously doesn't mean anxiety. Seriously doesn't mean depressive. Seriously doesn't mean oppressive. Seriously means like we take a relationship seriously. A beautiful relationship we take seriously. That doesn't mean that we don't love and have fun with the other person. If, if it did, relationships would be a superbly depressing situation to be in. Yet everyone's running to have one. Because they're actually intrinsically enjoyment. They're real. Our relationship with Hashem is no less real than that. If anything, it is more than that. He is no less compassionate than us. If anything, He is so much more compassionate than us. He's the one who understands us fully and absolutely. He's the one who always has and always will. And it happens by us taking an Elul minute by minute by minute by minute and making it real. Understanding that, not for Him, but for ourselves. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you for listening. <clears throat>